Hey listeners, it's Mallory Wilsey, chief producer of the Enrollify Network. And I want to take just a moment to tell you about another show on Enrollify that I know you'll love. The Hidden Gem is a new show hosted by Maya Demishkovich, CMO at Carroll Community College. This podcast is dedicated to empowering community college presidents, leaders, and marketing and communication professionals with the knowledge and insights that you need to harness the full potential of strategic marketing and communications within your institution. New episodes drop every other Monday, and you can subscribe to the show by visiting podcast.enrollify.org or just search for The Hidden Gem wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to the Hired Geek Podcast, where we explore the impact of edtech on the student experience with engaging, fun, and relevant conversations that honor the wide range of work happening all across the higher ed ecosystem. I'm your host, Dustin Ramsdale, Community Engagement Lead at Pathify. Join me every week for discussions with some of the best minds in education technology. The Hired Geek Podcast is a proud member of the Enrollify Podcast Network, a robust collection of shows designed to help higher education professionals like you grow every day. Explore all of our other shows at Enrollify.org or check out some of my personal favorites linked in the show notes below. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the leading AI-powered all-in-one student engagement platform helping institutions create meaningful, personalized, and engaging interactions with students. Learn more at Element451.com. It's always a pleasure for me when we get to have uh, faculty members on the show. We just don't have them on very often. Uh, for me, I think it just brings in a really great perspective. You know, like my background is more in like, you know, student affairs, student support. So I think it's just a, it's a different world. And I like to kind of bring it in and bridge those gaps and talk more about it. And our uh, guest today is a esteemed background, uh, working as a faculty member, working in mentoring students and uh, writing and just sort of being a very strong advocate for you know, liberal arts education and different things and cover as much as we can in uh, each conversation with folks like that. But uh, we will start out, though, as we always do. Bill, if you want to introduce yourself and your professional background briefly, and then we'll get into more about the work you do now and the the book uh, that kind of uh, inspired our conversation for today. Okay, so my name is Bill Copeland. I was born in Baltimore. My father had an eighth grade education. I was told to go to college to get a job. And my stepmother said, I better do that because I can't work with my hands, which was very accurate. I skipped a year, so I started college when I was 16, Washington College in Chestertown, Maryland. And I was in college to get prepared to have a job. And then in my first class, the English professor was teaching Chaucer, who doesn't even write in English, I discovered. It was um, pretty traumatic for me because why was I here? And I think a lot of students go through that. I realized that it's because he was wanting me to become a scholar and I wanted to be a person. And that event when I was 16 has driven my entire professional career because I went to, I transferred to Johns Hopkins, which, which I didn't even know was a high class place. I don't I even knew, what do I know? And I graduated there, didn't know what I wanted to do. They didn't even have, I don't think they had um, career services at Johns Hopkins in 1960. I don't think so. Anyway, because everybody was going to be a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer. Like, what was I going to be? I was not one of those. Uh, I ended up in international relations because I found it interesting. I applied for the foreign service. I got to the RO and passed the written. They rejected me. They told me to grow up and come back in five years. But meanwhile, I had um, registered, I had gotten into American University's School of International Service. And uh, at that, I guess they liked me there. And um, I became, they had me teaching classes in my second year of graduate school. And I was teaching, when, my fourth year when I finished my PhD, I was teaching two courses at Howard and two courses at American. And I, I thought, um, when you become a professor, you're supposed to be a teacher because I didn't really, I didn't know what was going on. I still didn't know what was going on. And I was an American, which had a lot of PhDs going into the CIA or the Defense Department, not going into academia. I think I was one of the first. And I ended up at Wayne State 
Um, and uh, then I discovered this publisher parish thing. And fortunately, I was really good at writing stuff. You know, book salesman came in and said, what's missing in your field? I said, an introduction to international relations. And he said, well, you want to write it? So what did I know? I said, okay, I'll write a book on that. So I wrote a book on that. And then I wrote a textbook on the internet. And then I read some of it. And I also got involved in the, at that time, um, simulation was a big field in international relations, which of course is really stupid when you think about it, having a bunch of teenage kids running around, like pretending they're prime ministers. But Wayne State had built a simulation lab and hired me to teach that there. And I, um, of course, I didn't even know what simulation was. I knew about flight simulators. So I figured it must have something to do with that. But before I um, went there, I ran a simulation in my class. So when they asked me, did you, um, what are you doing simulation? I said, well, I'm running one in my class right now. And so they hired me immediately. And, and I just published a lot. They made me a associate professor in two years and gave me tenure in the third year. They're trying to keep me out of the market. Then I went, I went to the dean and I said, I want to teach your thousand student introduction to social sciences, which was all graduate students doing the teaching. And he said to me, no, well, you, you can't do that. And I said, why not? He says, because we want you to keep publishing. And then it dawned on me, he, you know, he wanted to be the Ann Arbor of Detroit. And Ann Arbor wants to be the, the Harvard of Michigan, right? And Cornell, you, you know, that whole thing. So um, I said, well, I'm leaving because it's ridiculous. They, they created an MA program. They could get no students. And they were talking about a PhD Because program. I think we're about to you set know, up like my next question too, is like that. the work that you do now, because I know you've, you've been uh, doing what you're doing for a very long time. And I think like you're saying, like there's definitely like that core of, you know, all the way back in kind of your origin story of like, you know, higher education, the relevance of what you're learning and those sort of things. I think that's always been on kind of your mind and everything. So I guess, yeah, I will, you know, bridge the gap here to, I feel like you are setting up the early days of the work that you continue to do now. And I ended up in a position at Syracuse where I could make my own program and I did it to help undergraduates. So that's, that's the end of that. But I went through a lot of stuff before, but uh, I guess, yeah, have you found a place that culturally was a good fit, you know, the kind of work that you wanted to do to really feel like you're making a, an impact on students and providing, you know, a relevant education and all that. So I guess, yeah, just explain a bit about the work you do now. Like, it's, I guess now we're sort of giving the context that sort of directly led to, you know, decades of sort of, you know, working with students, mentoring them yeah. and talking about, you know, yeah. policy studies and all these things that feel obviously just very tangible and very relevant. I was... For lots of reasons, luck mainly, um, I was given the chair of a department called Public Affairs, which had been set up to teach freshman citizenship in the 30s. By the time I came along, it was destroyed because all the departments wanted the freshmen so they could increase their enrollment. Plus, they thought the course was stupid. That's an, but that, of course. And so... Um, I, the dean was very um, applied oriented, and he, unlike half the faculty who wants theory, and so he just wanted me to do this, and he made me make the policy studies major, and I define the major as the skills to do well and do good. Uh, that's that's what the major is, and it started in '78, and it's now over th close to 300 students now, and it grew over the years. Uh, and uh, it, there's a lot of reasons why I was successful. First, it met the needs of students. Like they were there to get the skills to get a job. That was like why they were there. But and, and and no other course or program met that need in the liberal arts. That's not what liberal arts does. It makes scholars. And um, now like, their their theory is well, if you're a scholar, you'll be successful in whatever career you you follow. And well, that's that's an untestable assumption. I don't. I don't believe that. Anyway, so I made this major called policy studies. And what I did, um, which was a crucial thing, was I decided I was not going to use graduate students. I had 150 students. 
I taught a 150 international relations course and I had two graduate students and they ran discussion sections and they didn't even know what the course was about. I would go in and watch them and they would not do what I told them to do. So I said, I'm never going to use a graduate student again, except I don't believe in multiple choice tests. So I have to have papers. I'm going to have 150 students and we're going to have five papers and I'm not writing 750 papers. So I had kids who took the course one semester become TAs the next semester. And that turned out to be revolutionary because it broke down the large class. It didn't feel, my 150 student class didn't feel like 150 because a t a t an undergraduate who just took the court was the coach of six kids or seven kids. Those undergraduates also recruited for the next class and most of them became policy studies majors. And so that process generated really elite students under my control. And um, the students I've had over the years and the, uh, the alums now, I mean, there's 20 CEOs and they're getting all kinds of jobs that perform. They did a little study and I don't know how much I think it's accurate is we have the highest job placement rate of the majors in, in, in the social sciences and, and the highest starting salaries. So there's a little empirical evidence that it actually works. But we have very loyal alum. So over the years, basically the undergraduates determine the content of the big freshman course mm -hmm. and then even later courses. Because no. oh, I keep saying to me, you got too much on this slide. Cut the slide in half. Oh, okay, okay. Then they would come up with ideas like community service. We should make them all do community service. And I said, well, that's a good idea. So we did that. And, and then the community service thing blew up and became very successful. We had a freshman course in community service, one credit. And so all the kids have to do this one credit community service. So what they're getting is a very applied, hands-on approach to studying um, policy. I also redefine policy as not necessarily public policy, but really everything is policy. Where your family eats Thanksgiving dinner is a policy decision, is a collective decision on people who have power. And that's the, no different than a president of the United States getting a collective decision for things. Just a lot more fighting goes on. And they bought that and the students have been very successful. So then I started saying, you know, I got to put this in the high schools. Well, at Syracuse University, they have everything called Project Advance. And my, my freshman course, they offer a freshman course for SU credit in high schools where the teachers deliver it. They actually started that model in the early 80s. And my course was the second biggest course in that group, and I have 50 or 60 high schools teaching it every semester. So thousands of students got it. And um, then when I got with the high school thing, and then I started, I really wanna help kids in the, in the less rich high schools where the kids are, you know, have money more challenges. And so starting in the 90s, I started running programs in the city of Syracuse, taking little pieces of the course um, like Excel or writing or doing little training sessions and having competitions. And then in the last five years, I actually have 10 to 20 students going out in two or three different high schools running these exercises and under the name of Skills Win. So it's pretty straightforward track of what I've been doing. Yeah, because I guess the, the core of it and the Try to kind of segue to um, the the book that sort of again like inspired our conversation today, like that idea of you know this the portability of it and the popularity of you know the policy studies and, the, and just that that content that you're uh, teaching on, like it's just helping to to bridge that gap of like you know the applicability, the relevance of liberal arts, and sort of like you know weaving that in so it's not just so much of like theoretical stuff because i think that idea of that anecdote that you shared about like you know having a really good uh job placement rate like for uh, students who major in policy studies and everything is it's like well yeah i'm sure that comparatively it is like 
you know, noteworthy thing because it's like, you know, like I was a history major. Like it, it gave me a lot like personally, but I couldn't tell you like how I would have if I was just graduating as a history major, like how would I parlay that into like other than just like teaching history to other people, you know, like that's always kind of like the pipeline sometimes of like higher ed. It's like, well, you'll know, major in something to just teach it to more people and it's just sort of self-serving in that way. So I guess just to, uh, you know, honor the book since it was sort of the, the catalyst that brought us here today, like, can you share a bit about the book, the inclusion and in the kingdom of the liberal arts uh, and how it came to be? Okay. So uh, I had published an article in, in uh, 2004 with the Chronicle of Higher Education called Law. They named it Lost in the Mind, and it made this argument, and it, 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 which is really the book, which is that liberal arts has a bait-and-switch business model. The bait is you'll get a job. The switch is you have to become a scholar. And so I had written a lot of stuff over the thing, but then I started thinking about, really, liberal arts is the problem because the liberal arts, the bait-and-switch model is is dysfunctional. It's wrong. It's it's evil. It's unethical. And but the faculty believe that scholarship leads to everything. And I don't see it. So I decided to write the book. I wrote a book really quickly. I had a student helping me who was great. First I talked about examples that a liberal arts is an elitist concept that's basically been very destructive, not just to college students, but the high schools, to the entire school system. Because you've got this college prep and you've got these grades and you've got this honor stuff and all this stuff, and half the kids aren't going to be scholar. And even if they were, they're not very good at it. And besides, we don't need more scholars because there are no jobs for scholars. So what are we doing here? So um, I show why it's so powerful because you have the college board spending a million dollars a year selling college, and you'll have the whole college going rate. And then you you have, I mean, even Teach for America, which is helping poor kids, their pitch is every guy, you know, our success is kids go to college. Well, college only has a 50, 60% graduation rate. I, I said in the book that the graduation rate of liberal arts programs or colleges in general is worse than the worst high schools in the country. So um, they, they fail everybody. And, and then the price went up, which is really sad. Um, so people are going into debt. So my argument is that liberal arts is an elitist approach. It sells elitism and it hurts most of the students who are commoners, I was going to call a book commoners in the kingdom of liberal arts, but I changed it. I don't, I'm not sure that was a good, <laughs> but I changed it. But it is, if it, I'm a commoner. I don't need this. I don't want this scholarship stuff. I want a job. I want skills. Yeah. I want to know what I want to do. Um, so, and then the liberal arts majors are, are rational. They say two things. One is, well, whatever you major in doesn't make any difference because liberal arts will prepare you. And then they say, so what's your major? And so the kids glom on, well, I got to have a major. And then the major people are selling, oh, yeah, you can get a job as a, uh, in anthropology. Yeah, I'm sure there are like 10 of them. Yeah, or whatever. Or a hunt. I like anthropology. The thinking about anthropology will make you more observant, better. But it doesn't lead to a job. It's theoretical. So there's this mixed message, and I think it's very destructive to undergraduates. And I've been, I, I see about, I don't know, 100 undergraduates a semester, mm -hmm. and I deal with freshmen a lot. They are so confused, is all they know is grades. I got to get a high grade. Uh, I don't really care about most of this. Um, and they're anxious because they don't know if they're going to get a high grade. Um, and so it, I think it creates a lot of stress and anxiety among the students. And of course, now push it down to high school or middle school. It's the same anxiety. My grades can be higher enough. If not, I'm going to be a failure. Yeah. Yeah. The answer is no, you can be a bummer and stop worrying about it uh yeah well yeah. yeah it's just like being like and that's okay you know like working in a trade or whatever and like having clear you know efficient pathways to get 
wherever people are going through, you know, kind of uh, post-secondary education. But kind of what you're saying, like, makes me think of like, there's definitely some clamoring, uh, which I think is just a healthy dialogue that I think kind of piggybacks on what you're saying of like, you know, okay, for a bachelor's degree, like, does it need to be four years? Like, maybe it could be three years. And part of that could be like, we obviously have this kind of you know, obsession with like, okay, well, you know, you have to have a wide breadth of, you know, requirements and like the liberal arts classes, no matter what your major is. And it's like, again, like, I think a lot of people can acknowledge like the earnest spirit of that is, you know, well placed and everything, but with increasing costs of higher education and just a lot of skepticism about the relevance, it's like, that could be a way where it's like, certainly, yeah, if you want to major in liberal arts, like choose that path deliberately and making an informed choice of like, that is what I want is a wide breadth of courses. I, I don't want to choose like a specific thing that is my major and feel like that's sort of like prescribed to me and everything. And there's certainly a lot of notions like you're saying, where like, oh, it doesn't matter what you major in. And I think there, there's some some truth to that, but it certainly does well serve you if like you get a credential, there's a clear portability of like, I majored in this. So people know that like i know computer science or something or whatever but like yeah certain majors that are just like entirely theoretical that portability i think is sort of undermined and then you still need to maybe get a certificate or get a master's to be like because that was like my, my path it's like well i was a history major in undergrad and then i went on to get my master's in studying higher education and college student affairs and it's like that's the thing that like allows me to have some sort of portability or just a clear signal to kind of the marketplace of being like, yeah, I'm a person right. who has specialized in a thing and all that. So I think there's just a lot here of like, you know, helping the relevance, the efficiency of higher education and all of that. So I guess if you can kind of summarize for listeners, like what are like the fundamental change that you are kind of arguing for that like, you think sort of the liberal arts model that higher education, whether it is a liberal arts college or just higher ed kind of writ large, like, what are the changes that you think need to be made here? Hey, it's Dustin here. Exciting news. I'll be at the Engage Summit in Raleigh, North Carolina on June 25th and 26th, and I'd love to meet you there. Hosted by Element 451, the Engage Summit is your roadmap for AI readiness in higher education. Sessions will focus on cutting-edge AI applications that are reshaping student outreach, enhancing staff productivity, and offering deep insights into ROI. This isn't your typical conference. It's a strategic summit where you'll learn from the best about leveraging AI and digital strategies and higher ed marketing. Imagine two days filled with hands-on sessions, real success stories, and the chance to network with top minds in the field. You'll leave with practical, transformative takeaways as you learn how AI fosters a more personalized, efficient approach from recruitment to student success. Oh, and the best part? The Engage Summit is incredibly affordable. Use the discount code Enrollify50 and you can register for just $99. So join me and many of my fellow Enrollify network creators at the Engage Summit this June. Learn more and register at engage.element451.com. Can't wait to see you there. Most of the education you're going to get in four years of college is not in the classroom. So you're in student affairs. You're in student affairs. I think student affairs, I think the president of the student government should give credit. And we got to give credit to these activities. At one time I got resident advisors, I got them to give three credits to the resident advisors. And my argument was, well, they're spending like 30 hours a week on this. Don't you think they're learning anything? I got away with it for a while, but then they wanted to take it over, so they put more readings in and everything. It was ridiculous. The experience of being a resident advisor is worth three credits, in my view, in skill development. President of a sorority, treasurer of a sorority. I mean, these are skill areas, and, they, and the thing is that student activities and jobs in college and internships determine how successful you'll be and where you're going. The classrooms are secondary. Now, unless I, I'm not talking about the kids that want to become professors and the scholars, because there are many of them. We forget those. A lot of the kids don't know they don't want to be scholars, and they're just high achievers, and then don't know what they want to do when they're seniors. So one of my things is, I think, if I could do this, 25% uh, of the 120 credits should be experiential. I think experiential education needs to be expand it. And, and what's happening is it is expanding because of the demand of the students. Faculty 
tend to, it's like, they don't really want to do this, but they have to do it because the kids want it. And of course it makes sense for them. Um, so I would say huge, huge emphasis on experiential credit, student activities, and they have a lot of, you know, like peer health educators, but that should get credit. Getting the students to perform functions that are relevant to their career interests and maybe their academic interests should be rewarded. The faculty doesn't want to do that um, because they think it's not rigorous. Rigor, in one of our chapters, is called dumbing down is dumb. This whole dumbing down thing, but well, forget it. You guys are dumbing down anyway. What are you even talking about, dumbing down? You are dumbing down. Stop it. Stop saying we don't want to dumb down. You are dumbing down. There's great inflate. Give me a break. So let's give them credit. Uh, my view is the time spent is the measure of the grade and degree. And I know a lot of people say that's that's dumbing down. And that. I yeah, fine. They can they can go for that. I don't buy it. Now, I have very specific things to make make lower division courses should be all applied. You don't take a course in learning the field of chemistry. You take a course in something to do with environment or health that's science based but problem based. I guess problem all all undergraduate lower division courses should be problem based. That would yeah. be another thing. And the experiential credit. But I also have a, a chapter on the biggest problem is the faculty and how they're trained. They are trained to not want to teach, even though the faculty will say we're teaching them to become teachers. They're lying. They're not that's not true. They don't their priorities not there. Their priorities on research. So you get a bunch of twenty five year olds together and they're trying to get their PhDs. A PhD is defined as a contribution to knowledge. That's such a lie. What, what, is, what does that mean? First of all, what knowledge is there? First of all, there's speculation with some research. Is that what you're calling knowledge? And now you're going to contribute something new? Give me a break. It's a lie. So you have the professors wanting their little people to make them proud by contributing to the literature and the PhD students are never happy. And some of them go into PhD because they want to teach. Uh, but they're getting wise to that now and they realize it's not. And very few of my students ever want to go into, into mm -hmm. PhD programs. Um, so the PhD training, here's my, I have a very specific formula. One third of the credits should be for research. One third should be for teaching. This is graduate credits. And one third should be for service. Because if you become a professor, you, you have a lot of service stuff you have to do. And besides learning the service will open you, make you better to get a real job someplace else. Because the, the way it works now is you're being socialized into a cult of researchers who disrespect Researchers in other fields, for example, like economists think all the social sciences not good, and the, and the physical scientists think everybody else doesn't even doesn't calibrate. Um, and then you get into this club, which means you join a subtribe of the professors who had subtribes. So there's like game theory in economics. So there's the game theory subtribe. So you you get sucked into that, and then you you tend to believe it. And you buy it as being very important and very important that students learn game theory when game theory is almost nothing from what I can see. I don't get it. It's prisoner's dilemma and like a couple other things. Right. I don't need it. So you have this club of tribal monks who earn their living off the income of undergraduates but really care about getting up to total pole. Getting well, I guess that, more that's the, sort of the, the point that I was making too, like, you know, the sort of self-perpetuating, you know, tendency, you know, and all this. And I think, yeah, and I, just to make it very clear, I absolutely agree with what you're saying of like, you know, if you're in a student leadership position, and certainly there can be kind of a boundary of like, you know, because a lot of institutions have like just a myriad of different like clubs, but it's like, I think there's some that are very clear, 
you know, the commitment is very large and the impact of it is very meaningful of like, okay, RAs, orientation leaders, you know, fraternity, sorority life presidents and like, you know, student government, like there's sort of a, a short list there that I think, you know, you're, you're making a, a large commitment of your time. And it's honestly like, okay, if you can't literally pay these you know, these students, like, which I think you should. And then even on top of that, it's like, yeah, give them credit, at least, you know, some portion of it of like, you know, I don't know how you sort of like, you know, you know, kind of delegate out those credits or whatever, but it's like, you know, those credits have a cost and like they're, they're giving so much of their time and, and supporting their fellow students and all of that. So I think that's a big one. And then I think the experiential piece too, of just sort of like embedding in the curriculum, more applied project-based, like sort of, you know, hands-on kind of things so that it's like, yeah, like you're, you're learning chemistry, but it's like, okay, you know, applied chemistry and like the, the real world or whatever. I'm just sort of like the things day to day that you'd likely uh, actually encounter, like that could be a way to sort of like try to find some compromise maybe of like, okay, well, we're not going to just like, you know, do away with all these sort of courses that we've kind of uh, culturally kind of had this tradition of, of teaching. It's like there was a dean that wanted me to convince the science faculty to have more experiential. So I went to him and I said, why don't you take the kids in your science courses who aren't going to go into science and have them tutor in the high schools? You know, have them tutor chemistry in the high school. You know what they said to me? No, because they don't teach the right science in a high school, and those kids would learn the wrong thing. I, I was like blown away when they said that. They just couldn't. I, and on student affairs, I've sat in meetings where faculty have raised and said, why are we paying for student affairs? Why, why are we not hiring more faculty? Why are we putting money in student affairs? I keep my mouth, I keep my mouth shut at the meetings because it doesn't do any good. And it's just, I'm observing, I'm a participant observation, but it was like, it's a fit. It's so dedicated to being a scholar, to being a monk in their tribe that they can't see beyond it. Now, I think things are changing. Faculty are younger. I think the kids are less compliant. You know, the picture of the book says it all. If you remember, it's got a teacher with the kids in sleep, asleep in front of them. If you don't get engagement, you got nothing. If you can't get the students engaged, you got nothing. So I, I would even think if they were tutoring chemistry in high school, they might even ask some questions about chemistry. If, and they'd be uh, engaged. Engagement is the key. We're at this like sort of watershed moment where like there's a lot of like just, you know, pressures from, you know, whether it's like government or just society and all that, like there's like so much more awareness of like, okay, clearly there's sort of a dissatisfaction or people think that, yeah, like higher education is irrelevant and all that. And it just really is up to, you know, each institution culturally to bring people together and see if, you know, they can kind of build that coalition of people thinking like, okay, this is like important enough for us to, to make some sort of change to our curriculum and all those sort of things where, you know, in the past, yeah, there's these sort of, you know, antagonistic relationships between like, you know, academic affairs and student affairs or, you know, just very entrenched ways of doing things. And that sort of self-perpetuating, you know, scholarship kind of thing where it's like, like, you know, research and all that, like it has its place. But like we're getting to a place where obviously institutions are just closing at a fairly, you know, ready pace. So it's like, OK, well, we clearly need to make some sort of adjustments and everything. And obviously, yeah, you've given some some good ideas for folks to kind of think about. And um, I think as we wind down, you know, we always kind of give our guests the opportunity for sort of the the final thought, the call to action to kind of summarize everything, wrap up the episode. So the floor is yours. Do with it what you will. Well, uh, I think if, if you're a parent, tell your kids, They'll learn more outside the classroom than in the, in the classroom. If, if, if you're a student, stop worrying about GPA. It's your experience and your skills. There's nothing other than your experience and your skills that will make you have a successful career or be a good citizen. There's nothing better than that. And use your college to do that. And actually, I think what I'm calling for is happening. You can see it like more experiential credit offered, interdisciplinary courses, which allow more slippage, great inflation. I think great inflation is great. 
because it frees the kids to like do what they need to do and want to do. So I think we're on it, but there's a rear guard action that's trying to stop it. And then you have the fight with the DEI group versus the conservatives, which is a sideshow, which really has nothing to do with anything other than them. <laughs> right. I mean, like, it's like the idea of like stuff like that takes up people's time and attention and all that. So it's like, well, we can't do other stuff if that's like, you know, where the president's focus is or, you know, whoever else. But yeah, I mean, it's the idea of, you know, these trend lines that I think are emerging and just like, you know, change only happens by like, people's efforts and, you know, folks like yourself advocating for it and showing, you know, good examples and being role models and sort of living out the values that they're sort of, you know, advocating for and everything. So I think it's that idea of like, we can't just assume that higher ed, especially, you know, these venerable institutions that have been around for hundreds of years are just going to, you know, immediately align with sort of market forces or student preferences or whatever else. It's like, it takes consistent, concerted, effort and collaboration and, you know, people coming together and sort of understanding, you know, what needs to be done. And, and then there's also not just like one only single way to do any of these things. So I think like you're, you're giving great examples and you, you put in the work to make a book and uh, outline everything. So we'll have ways to connect with you and your work and uh, everything in the description of the episode. But um, I just thank you so much for, for all that you do and for taking time out of your day to hang out for the podcast. Today. Hired Geek Podcast is a part of the Enrollify Podcast Network. If you like this podcast, chances you'll like all the other Enrollify shows too. Our podcast Network is growing constantly, and we've got a plethora of marketing, enrollment, and higher technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks all designed to empower you to be a better hired professional. Our shows help you find your next big idea and feature a selection of the industry's best as your host. Learn from people like Jamie Hunt, Seth O'Dell, Dave Kibbolds, and Eddie Francis, as well as so many other of your favorite leaders in higher education. Enrollify is made possible by the support of Element 451, a leading AI-powered, all-in-one student engagement platform helping institutions create meaningful, personalized, engaging interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com.